Welcome you guys, welcome to another parent workshop. I just want to introduce a new friend of mine named Zoe and I reached out to Zoe to ask her to come and speak to us because last summer during COVID times, I stumbled across her wildflower guide, which is the coolest thing on the planet. And we bought it, we printed it out and we took it with us to, Net to Denali and my kids learned half of the flowers in Alaska because of it. And it was just such an easy, fun, cool way to teach my kids that I Instagrammed Zoe and was like, hey, come talk to us. Please come teach us. How do you educate your kids while having fun outdoors? So she has been gracious enough to come and share her brain and her resources with us. So I just want to thank you in advance, Zoe, for being here and turn the floor over to you. Okay. Hi. Um, can you all hear me? This is my first time really doing a Zoom. Um, my name's Zoe, and like Katrina said, she reached out to me over Instagram, and um, we were able to kind of set this up. Can you all see the screen? Okay. All right. I think I'm going to just go ahead and get started. So I'm I'm just going to be talking a little bit about getting outside in Alaska with your kids. Um, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Zoe. I have a background in environmental studies. I got it from here at, um, at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And then most of my background is in vegetation work which means that I go out for big development projects and I look at the ground and just look at plants and kind of see what's there and what's not. And, and that's kind of what I do part-time during the summer. And then during the winter, I just started um, like a small Etsy business that I've been running uh, through my home, which has been pretty new, um, but good. And I have a, I have a son who is six and he is in kindergarten and my I'm also mother to my husband who is uh, 36 and uh, we yeah have just been up here um, I guess the thing that I wanted to say in the beginning is just like I feel a little bit of a fraud talking to a homeschool group because uh, I have one kid and he's not in homeschool and so um, maybe take everything I say with like a spoonful of salt and uh, just take what you like glean what you can and then everything else just like don't even worry about so um, that's a little bit about us um, I wanted to talk uh, I you know we all live in Alaska we live in I think the most beautiful state it's wide and it's open and it's pretty easily accessible. And um, I love that in the winter we get kind of crazy because it's really dark and then we get kind of crazy in the summer because it's really light and we want to go do everything. Um, and so here's, I, um, I wanted to start by sharing a few of the lessons that I've learned just with having Will, things that he's taught me. One of the biggest things, and I think the number one lesson that I've learned is to just lower your expectations when you go outside with kids. Um, you're probably not gonna reach the point that you want to. You're not gonna reach the end of the trail or the top of the mountain. Um, it's really good when you leave the parking lot because um, they tend to like want to build a rock pile right there in the parking lot and you know I always want to get to that noteworthy spot that picture taking area and a lot of times we just don't make it um, and that's that's okay um, so just keep that in mind when you go out um, and then it's all trial and error when you go out with your family um, and you really have to find what works with your own family um, like I mentioned before, it's just uh, my husband and Will and I, so we have a really small family. It's easy to pack up and get out and go, and honestly, a lot of times my husband's working. He works a lot and works odd hours, so a lot of times it's just Will and I, um, and so we've kind of found what works for us, and um, for me, a lot of times I get out, it's, it's for my own mental health. 
um, and for my own attitude. So it's kind of a selfish reason why I'm getting out. And, um, but I think I'd like to think that it benefits him too. Um, I know that I'm a better mom when I'm outside. I'm less distracted. I'm able to focus on him more and, and I'm just really grateful for that. And then the last kind of lesson that I learned, I have learned is just bring food. Like that's super simple. And I think we all recognize that we get really hungry when we're outside and we get really grumpy. I grew up with an aunt who would always take us out when we were kids. Um, I have three other siblings and she would take me and my older brother a lot. And she would always say like, the reason we go outside is that we can eat the candy and the cookies and the soda and the chips and eat all that because I don't know, she said it always tastes better outside. And I really think that's kind of true. So I feel like half of my pictures are us just eating outside. So anyways, bring food. Um, and then, so one of the things that I've been asked to kind of talk about is, is outdoor study, uh, things that we can do to kind of look at nature. Um, and I would just say, get low. Uh, get down on your children's level, get down with them, um, look at things really closely, sit down, take your time, get on your knees um, and look at things. And this is all coming from the point of me being a botanist. Um, we always bring uh, magnifying glasses and hand lenses, things to just look up close and take our time. Um, there's a picture of my son there and he's eating some mountain sorrel and it kind of tastes like sour skittles. And so just being, you know, being able to try new things. And, um, and then there's a picture down there below with my husband and he's tide pooling uh, with Will. And that's one of his favorite things to do. He grew up in Kodiak uh, tide pooling when he was a kid. And so um, whenever we go out in the summers, um, he loves to go out tide pooling and just kind of peek around. And um, I think one of the things that we love to do is if we're out and there's something new that we've encountered or um, my son's really into frogs, like we spend a lot of time YouTubing things when we get back and looking, you know, what frogs live here in Alaska and, and what's going on with them. And um, it's been kind of a good thing. Um, when we go out, we spend a lot of time playing I Spy and 20 Questions. And I've learned that if you're interested in something, uh, they will also be very interested, or hopefully they will. Um, and then, yeah, so that's kind of that. Um, last spring, when COVID first hit, uh, we had just come back from Hawaii and it was a kind of a hard transition to come home with everything shut down. Um, and this was one of the things that kind of butted out of homeschooling Will for the spring was this early spring scavenger hunt. And I can send Katrina a copy of this and you can send it out to everyone. Um, it's just a list of things that you can normally find outside in Alaska in the early spring. We use an egg carton to kind of collect everything that's on the list. And I you know, let him carry a big pencil and, and collect things. And it just kind of, spring is kind of lame in Alaska. You know, we don't have many flowers out and it's not really warm. So it's kind of a fun afternoon activity. Um, and so that's one thing we like to do. Um, I also wanted to talk about different field guides and books and resources coming from um, a plant perspective in Alaska. So uh, another thing that came out of COVID were these wildflower guides that Katrina talked about. Um, these came off of a long boat trip that I was on uh, with my husband and my son and um, was able to just really draft something up and, and then uh, just worked on my carpal tunnel, trying to write everything really little. Um, but these, I was kind of asked to talk about them a little bit. Um, on each of the sheets, there's two sheets. There's the wildflowers of Alaska, which is more of the lowland common areas, um, roadsides, fields, things like that. And then the blue outline copy is the alpine wildflowers. And those are the flowers that you're gonna find above tree line uh, 
more often here in Alaska. Um, and then each picture is accompanied with the scientific name up top, uh, and that's in Latin. And then the bottom is one of the common names. Most plants have lots of different common names. Um, there's also a small box in each of the pictures, and those are for checking them off. And then there's an, also a number two, which is normally in the lower uh, right-hand corner. And that corresponds to back of the page where you'll see the, uh, the name of the plant and the blooming period and where most often that you'll find it. Um, and those I have, I have those for sale. Uh, this is my shameless artist plea. Um, they're on my Etsy site at wildspookyroots.etsy.com. So if that's something you're interested in, um, I do laminate them. That is an option. And so you can use them over and over and, and beat them around. So uh, some of the things that we take out into the field, uh, my son and I is, I always bring a camera and normally it just, just my phone, it just slips in the back pocket, takes good pictures. I'll bring a collection container. So like an old Nalgene bottle or some plastic Tupperware uh, anything to use to kind of collect things that they find exciting or maybe you find exciting um, and you can stuff that in your bag and, and take it home. Um, I think that we all have kids who have uh, shelves full of rocks and sticks and um, maybe something moldy that they have uh, kept in their room. Um, we also have uh, small plant presses and you can find those online on Amazon. I make a few or you can just make your own with like some books and cardboard and some newspaper. Um, if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about plant pressing. Um, magnifying glass we normally bring, you can find those on Amazon. They're big and bulky and they get dropped, you know, who cares? Um, I also bring a hand lens. I don't think I have a picture of it, but it's really small. They also call them jeweler's lenses and you can wear them around your neck. And those have really high powerful magnification, which is really kind of cool to get really up and close and personal with some of these plants. And you can see some of the plant parts and the reproduction and it, it's pretty kind of neat. Um, a notebook and pencil, you can write down, you know, where you are, what the kids are seeing, what they're liking, you can draw. Um, and then I always bring some field guides, um, a couple books, um, things, that I've just always kind of trusted. And then at home, uh, we have a microscope. Uh, that was one thing that I got for my birthday a couple years ago, because I'm a giant nerd. And it's been a really good investment. Um, a lot of times we'll bring home plants or dragonflies or, you know, dead butterflies, and we'll be able to look at them underneath the microscope. And um, it's just kind of, it's cool for him, but it's really cool for you know, us adults too, we spend a lot of time going, oh, this is really cool. And so uh, these are the best field guides that I have found for learning the plants here in Alaska. Um, the big black one, The Flora of Alaska, that's a really hefty book. Um, if you're really into plants, um, the, you can find that at the herbarium at, at the Anchorage uh, University. Otherwise, I'd probably suggest not buying it. Uh, the boreal herbal um, in the center is a great if you are looking into medicinal uses of plants. Um, I definitely lack in that area. I approach things a lot from a scientific perspective of, you know, why are plants here? Why are they growing? Um, are they, you know, are they stressed? Are they struggling? But I don't always look into the, the medicinal purposes of them. And that's something that I'm trying to get better at. A lot of my friends are really into making salves and tinctures and things like that. And um, this is a great book to learn. Anything by Verna Pratt that she wrote. Um, she was, I think she was from, she was from the East Coast, but she lived up here in Alaska for a long time. And she wrote all these wildflower books and they're the best because they're color coded, which is the easiest way to learn the plants, I think. Um, so you can flip through if you find a white flower that you don't know what it is, you can flip through and find uh, white flowers in there and look through them until you kind of find something similar. Um, and then these other two books on the other side are uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, one's more for edible harvesting and then the alpine plants um, are a good plant to take if you're up in the mountains. Uh, 
Um, these are also some really great websites if your kids are in to, you know, if it's easier to look on the internet. Um, the, the one I think, hopefully it's all mirrored uh, in the upper left hand corner is inaturalist.org. And that's, it's kind of like the Instagram of the natural world. You can take a picture on your phone and then upload it onto iNaturalist. And if you have questions, you can write, I have no idea what this is, what is it? And people can come along and say, well, okay, well that's, you know, that's ger geranium arianthum. And I know that. And then you can have, it'll go through a secondary review and like two or three other people will, you know, confirm or deny that uh, diagnosis of that plant. Um, and they, it's, it goes for plants, it goes for animals and birds and fungi and pretty much anything that grows or lives will be on iNaturalist. And uh, it's a really good, easy way to use. And it's, on, and it's an app, which is always great. Um, the one below it is Flora of Alaska. It's a project that's going on to revamp that big black book that I showed in the last slide. Um, and this is being done through a grant with um, University of Alaska and the consortium of, I can't remember what it's called, um, but it's all through kind of UAA, UAF, and they are digitizing that book. Um, and then the other two sites uh, are, the one in blue is really great. It has a lot of pictures. It has a lot of scientific names. You can click on it and find out, you know, what's in the Primulaceae family, you know, and, and find out what all the primroses are. And you can look at them. It's a really good way. And then the one below, I just found through a Google search and they just have beautiful pictures. And um, so if you see something that you like, it's like, oh, I, I've seen that before, so. Um, and then I was going to talk a little bit about our favorite local places. So I grew up here in Alaska and we live out here in Palmer and just love Alaska and really love the areas that you can easily get to, the ones that have big parking lots, like we like all those things. Um, so if you are in Anchorage, I think Katrina said a lot of, um, a lot of people are in Anchorage. These are a few of the areas kind of out here in the valley. Um, this is, these pictures are from the Kinnick River and you can also access the Matanuska River and they're great places that you can pull aside and um, especially when the water level is low in the spring and in the fall, they're great places to bring kids to throw rocks. There's lots of big flat rocks out here that are good for skipping and the water's freezing cold. Um, so just keep that in mind, it's not, definitely not warm, not really bathing water, but um, sometimes they do. And then another place that we love to go is Hatcher Pass, which I, um, I think I always feel like Hatcher Pass is Alaska's hidden gem. So uh, we always go up to the Reed Lakes Trail to look for blueberries. They get tracked out pretty fast, but I think it's beautiful country, beautiful wildflowers, especially in uh, June, July timeframe. And then April Bowl is also in uh, Hatcher Pass, it's up high, so if you're headed up to the mine, you'll swing a left and you'll head up the road like you're headed over to Willow. And it's at the very, uh, it's up at the summit. And it's a pretty, pretty easy hike up to the lake. And then there's a higher cirque that you can walk around the lake up on the ridge line. Um, this was Will hiking that in that center picture. He was about four, three, four. So um, it's pretty accessible and, you know, keeps busy kids happy. Um, and then the other one in Hatcher Pass is, of course, Independence Mine. You can drive right to it. Um, there's lots of things to climb on, lots of places to look. Um, I like going on crummy days because there's less people and, and you really get free roam of, of the whole place. Um, another place that we love to go, I hope this is okay, Katrina, talking about this. Um, but we always go out to Pyra's Pioneer Peak Farm. I always feel like I have to put a plug in there because I used to work there when I was 16. And it's a great place to take kids and get food. And their prices are really great. Kids get muddy. It's fun. Um, and then a few other places. Portage Lake we love. Um, it's close and uh, beautiful water. 
yeah, great biking trails too around the campgrounds. Uh, Anchor Point's the center one, center picture, and just miles of beach walking, which is great. Um, and then of course the Butte. Uh, we live right out here in the Butte, and so being able to go out and climb the Butte, it's really short, it's nice and dusty, kids love it because they get so dirty. So, um, And then if all else fails, like I just chuck my kid outside. Um, we garden a lot in the summer and just water, anywhere with water, anything with mud, um, playgrounds, anything. It's just easy outside. So, um, and then I feel like I have to put this in because I talk about all these great places and all these wonderful things, but there's always like a few trips every year where I call them MIF days, where they're mom-induced family fun days. Like mom is requiring like, hey, let's go out. We're gonna have so much fun. And everybody's just pissed the whole time. And no one's having fun, but it's like, well, we kind of had fun. So, um, and these were some of our trips. So, you know, bring food, it helps. And then uh, that's kind of it. So. That's all I have. Any questions? I don't, I don't know what, what, <laughs> what to do. <laughs> you shouldn't have told people that you're not an expert because you were such an expert. Oh my goodness. I'm watching all of this and thinking like, I struggle with doing all of this with my kids. So you are totally an expert. That's all I have to say to you. Well, I have one kid and you have six, so. But yours yeah. is outside and mine aren't. So, I mean, come on. <laughs> well, I appreciate every little bit of what you shared that I want to go out and buy some little um, microscopes for my kids now suddenly. So nice. yeah, well, I have one other thing I thought I would share because I, like I said, I'm not an expert at all, but I have one thing I could show you guys, which is something I did with my kids and have done frequently with my kids. It's a little bit more planned, but I'll show you one thing that I've done too. So um, my, I have one of my kids that's very into birds, loves birds. And so um, somebody recommended this Falcon Pocket Guide, Birds of Alaska. So um, I thought I'd just show you what it looks like on the inside. I just screenshot it on Amazon, but basically it's got a picture of the bird and then it tells you all sorts of cool things about it. And we just kind of have this on hand and um, even when we're at home and we're not outside or in the summer when we're all over the place. Oh, sorry. My light turns off if I don't move. So hang on. Okay. Um, so we've got this on hand and my daughter, my son, whoever sees a bird, we just flip to this and we find it. And um, this is what I have my kids do afterwards. I have them draw it. So this is my 10 year old my um, seven-year-old and my five-year-old would not look this beautiful, but I have them draw whatever they've seen. So my 10-year-old was super excited that she found a red-breasted nuthatch outside of my door. I did not see this bird, nor do I even know what this bird is, but she found it in the little pocket guide. So I was like, hey, I have some of these little notebooks on hand. I was like, hey, go draw it. I want to see what it looks like. So she drew it for me. So then I'm like, hey, why don't you add its name down there? And she did. And so then I just kind of left it alone. And then the next day we came back and I was like, hey, tell me what you saw it doing. And so she, she wrote, you can see, I saw a red-breasted nuthatch hopping in the tree in the yard and it is very small. So um, then I just kind of put it away again and was like, thanks, thanks for telling me about the bird you saw. So then I have all these little plush birds that you can see over here. I used my allotment to purchase these. And I'm going to just click and show you Acorn Naturalist is a really cool place to buy hands-on sciencey kind of stuff. So they have all of these birds and when you squeeze them, it makes their actual call. So I've got these at my house and my, my kids just play with them for fun. But I've noticed that when we're out walking, they'll recognize a bird call. They'll be like, hey, I just heard, and they'll tell me the bird call that they have just heard because they've been playing with these little birds. And um, that is like the easiest way I've taught my kids anything. I mean, I can't even really take credit for teaching them anything, but 
they started to recognize them by their call. And so I just wanted to show you these because like there's so many. And again, I just used my allotment. I purchased the whole lot and I've just got them in a bin in my living room. <laughs> Some of them don't make any noise anymore because they annoy people. And so my kids like to annoy each other with them. So you've been warned that'll probably happen. But um, this chickadee, I showed you a picture of that one because that's the first time my daughter, she heard it while we were walking. She said, mom, I hear a chickadee. And I'm like, how do you know what a chickadee sounds like? So I just wanted to share acorn naturalist with you guys because if you want to make it a little bit more formal, they even have, like I'm gonna click on this little owl kit here. You can buy these um, discovery kits about not just birds, about anything. And it comes with that bird that, so it comes with an owl that makes the call. You can see here, you've got some pellets you can dissect. You've got like a claw. And then I'm gonna scroll down and show you They've even got feathers, like we've gotten some of their feather kits. And these are just fun things to have around your house. So um, they've got leaf kits, they've got tree rounds, all sorts of really fun stuff. And it's not exactly unschooling. I mean, you're buying this and you're setting it around your house in hopes that your kids will like be into it. But I just wanted to share all of that with you because those are things that I've done with my kids that have been really easy to do over the summer. My kids don't even know that they're learning or like this little nut hatch. My daughter just did that the other day. And so um, it's just kind of seizing the moment when your kids are into something and um, being like, hey, let's, and this is my work sample. So don't tell my daughter that or she might not enjoy it anymore. But um, this is me taking the outdoors and what my kids love about the outdoors and, and making it a learning experience. So I hope that helps a little bit too, because um, I know nothing of plants. Zoe is totally the expert on plants, but I can share with you a little bit about how we've learned about birds and leaves and, you know, all that good stuff. So if you have questions, go ahead. Now's your chance to ask. Okay, and if you don't, then you are free to go enjoy your Friday evening. But again, I just want to tell Zoe, thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing um, your wisdom and also just some great ideas on how to have fun with our kids this summer. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Pleasure. I finally have some ideas because uh, I've lived here almost 30 years, but um, my parents were never really outdoorsy. And so my friends really weren't outdoorsy when I was younger. And I appreciate now that my kids are younger, getting them outside, but I don't even know where to begin. So this <laughs> helps a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. And thank you for sharing about the acorn naturalists too. I'll have to look that up. Oh, watch out. You're going to spend all your money there. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, and so Nicole asked, how do you turn in work samples for this type of schooling? And so um, there's lots of ways. That little picture that I showed you, that my daughter, where she drew the bird and then she wrote what she saw about the bird, um, that's totally a work sample. Another thing you can do is you can record your child talking about like, hey, we went to Denali and we found all these flowers. Or you can take a picture just like Zoe did of the scavenger hunt and then of their little egg carton of where they found those items. That's a perfect work sample. Um, literally anything that shows that your child learned something about science is a work sample. So you can get super creative. Um, and I think the flower press is something that we did last summer is we pressed some of those flowers that we found. And then when we got back home, I had my kids just pick one flower and then um, they put it on a piece of paper and then they wrote its name and then that was the work sample. So um, yeah, so there's millions of ways. And I think that's one of the reasons we, we keep doing school during the summer because I feel like it's just a wealth of science knowledge that your kids don't even realize that they're actually doing school. It just feels fun. And then you don't have to do so much during the fall because you've done most of your science during the summer. So. I hope that answered your question, Nicole. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, if you have more, you can text me. I never go outside, so I'll be a terrible person to talk to. 
but um, I can also show you how to talk to Zoe, so that can work too. Thanks again for hanging out with us on Friday night, and have a great rest of your night.